A very good evening, a good afternoon, and a good morning to everyone attending this masterclass on sports management today from Geo Institute. Uh, we are very pleased to share with you that this is our first ever sports management masterclass, and uh, we are happy to have Dr. Andy Gelantin, one of our mentor and also advisor for the program with us. The title of this masterclass is The Evolution of Sports Consumption. Dr. Gelantin would be taking us through his uh, uh, presentation for the moment within like 30 to 40 minutes and then the floor would be open for a question and answer not just about the program but also since we have started our admissions process we were looking forward to take a lot of questions on that just to give a brief about the master class this is targeted at uh, working professionals aspiring to be future sports managers Sports managers were already working in the industry, but looking to upgrade their professional skills and looking at an academic program. And thirdly, any sports enthusiasts who are eager to learn about sports management, what, what it means to understand the business of sport. Um, Dr. Andy Gillentin, who would be taking us through, is a professor in the De Department of Sports and Entertainment Management at the University of South Carolina. He is internationally recognized for his expertise in sports management curriculum and program development, and has participated in sports management program and career enhancement activities in more than a dozen countries. And with that background, we are extremely grateful and you know, uh, like excited to have him in the program because he brings in an element of understanding sports from the consumer point of view, and thus address the core uh, focus group that is the athlete and the fan and spectator. We understand that uh, at the heart of sports is the athlete and the consumer. And by consumer, we mean the fans, the viewers, and the spectator who consume sports either in the stadium or digitally. Uh, sports consumer consumption patterns, motivation, and expectations continually evolve. And thus, these changes may potentially impact the revenue stream even management and facility design. Now we do understand that the, the driving force behind sports management is the broadcast industry and the bidding that happens around mega sports event. So thus, uh, with that context, I would like to hand over the floor to Professor Gelentin and take us through the consumption of sports and the evolution of sports management. Dr. Gelentin, it's over to you. Thank you very much. First, let me say that I am honored I'm flattered and I'm excited to be here with all of you today, this evening. It's my pleasure to be a part of GEO Institute to help represent, to help build what I think is gonna be a very dynamic and very exciting program for you. I'd like to be able to think about the ability that we're going to have to do collaborative things that we can take each other's ideas, work our way through them and come up with new, innovative, exciting ways to deal with the challenges that are existing today and in the future in sport management. So with that, let's jump into our topic today. So if we can put the first slides up. If we take a look at the idea of sport consumption, Rajeshri was absolutely on target when we talk about all the different ways that people consume our product. And I think we need to think about it that way just so we begin to put ourselves in the position of making good, good decisions based on data, based on feedback that help us improve the product and to meet consumer needs, desires, and wants. I'd like to think that we're entering a period where it's really the renaissance era of sport management. And I refer to it that way because it is part of the almost a rebirth that we're having of our industry. Many of the core principles have not changed. Many of those are still the same in that we love the sport, but the things that have changed are the ideas behind sport consumption and the attitudes and needs of the consumers. Part of this has been fueled by the need of our industry to continue to grow in economic setting, that we have gone from being an inexpensive entertainment option to in many cases, a very expensive and almost exclusive luxury item. 
Sometimes we place consumers in the position where they're having to make an economic decision between whether they need to attend or consume the sporting event or pay other bills, et cetera, in their lifestyles. I think as professionals, we need to keep that in mind as we make our decisions and as we prepare going forward in the future. You can flip forward a couple of slides for us. One more, please. And one more. I like to think about this importance of understanding monetarily where we are. In the early days of the sport, I always jokingly referred to it, we developed a cigar box mentality. And as that means that as we collected our gate receipts, we collected our monies from ticket sales while people came into our events, that there were so little funds involved, we might actually keep the money in a cigar box, only to be counted at the end of the evening and that would be it. It was never such an amount. We all know that is not true anymore. And yet at times, I think we still have remnants of this cigar box mentality that we don't recognize how expensive we have become and how much it costs to generate our products. The industry in and of itself generates billions of dollars now, billions of dollars. So we have to recognize those changes and how they affect our consumer. Next slide, please. Yeah, the late Ming Li, who I think was one of the well-noted financial experts in the field of sport, told me years ago that he felt that the overall global impact in terms of monetary impact was probably too great to measure accurately. And with that, I want us to always think in terms of estimates. Estimates tell us today that the sport industry generated between 400 and 500 billion dollars worldwide. And again, those are estimates. The estimates going forward in 2023 are going to be in excess of 500 billion dollars. With that in mind, we have to think, are we just trying to pass on those costs and monies generated? Are we, how are we bringing those funds in? That's what we have to consider, and we have to consider other ways to do that. Next slide, please. From years of studying consumers, and particularly sport consumers, we understand fairly well the different motives that drive people to consume our products. The idea of achievement that can be met through consuming our product. We can be one with the team. We celebrate their wins. We can celebrate their losses even, and that they are part of us. The acquisition of knowledge, we become more and more skilled in understanding and for a lot of individuals, knowing the intricacies of the strategies of the game is important to them. For many, it's the aesthetics. I know the Olympic Games have often made quite a move forward with consumption, selling the aesthetics of the Olympic experience. But we do the same, the smell of the food, the roar of the crowd. That's all part of that. The drama, the idea of can the underdog win? Will the favorite team pull through again? All that is part of what we do. I also think many consumers come in for the idea of I can escape my everyday life. I, for just a couple of hours at the pitch, I can forget work for a while. I can become part of something else. That's part of it. For others, it's family. We're able to bring the generations together. We're able to share things. I know even with my own family, we can have debates both good-naturedly and pointedly about our favorite teams and who's playing over the weekend. Skill levels, we always know that some, part, some parts of consumption can lead to the desire to participate, to develop skills within that. And it can be skills that transfer themselves into physical activity, skills understanding management like we do. I know there are many internet fantasy worlds that you are able to manage the teams and manage your budgets. All those fit into this, why would I want to consume this product? Physical attraction, we can love sport as an art form. We can enjoy watching all the players do things that are amazing on the court or on the field. And the last one is probably through social interaction. Now, these are not in any ranked order. And if I had to say the ones that I really want you to keep in mind, it's probably going to be escape and social interaction. It's the social interaction that we are beginning to see 
is a greater driver than perhaps many of the others. So we're going to take a look at how do we help people as they've changed their forms of social interaction and incorporate those into our sport consumption. Next slide, please. Rolf Jensen wrote a very interesting book and series of papers that dealt with the dream society. And I think this actually helps us understand the mind of many of our current sport consumers. Within this, he felt that the dream society would be the ultimate societal group, that they would, almost in Maslow's concept of the hierarchy of needs, have reached that level of self-actualization, that they had the material wealth, the emotional wealth, and levels of personal fulfillment, that now they were looking for those little extra bits and pieces that they could grow from. And I think we're not far off from that, as many poor people in the world do have that sense of perhaps they're not uber rich, but they're wealthy enough that the everyday concerns that Maslow would have brought up are no longer great concerns. They have the money to survive. Now, how do we do this and get the other things that we want in life? So as we take that concept and start to apply it to our sports setting, let's go on to the next slide. These days, sport consumption, it's a hard pill for many people to swallow, but it's not just about the game anymore. It's about all the ancillary pieces that surround the game, the things that the consumer wants, demands, and now sees as an important part of the sport consumption experience. Look at things that they want. The first, they want a high quality event and environment. Gone are the days when we just open the gates and the fans are happy. Some may still be that way, but we're finding the majority want more. They have high expectations of what they want, those increasing levels that they expect this, this, and this. The wooden bleacher is no longer any good. The plastic bench won't work. I like a seat back. I want armrests. I need cup holders. There's all these pieces at just basic levels that have increased more and more and more. We have to make sure that we're delivering those. People want what we call high touch opportunities. How can I get the interactions that I want? How can I be a part of things? Those are all part of it. They feel as if they want to have some influence on the event. And that can become in multiple forms. And I give credit to many sport marketers and sport managers. They've tried different ways to let the fans become even more engaged. And we have to find ways to do that. That interactive presence makes them feel more if we were back with our motives. Now that grouping can become my family. That can become that shared. That can become the acquisition achievement that I want. So those are things that we have to keep in mind. This helps them develop a personal sense of identity and meaning. And this can carry on throughout the world. One of the joys of internet communication and streaming services for televised events is that this allows people to stay connected. I can still root for my favorite team when I'm in Mumbai, when I'm in Aruba, or whether I'm in the United States. This allows that to have a sense of identity. Uh, the idea of self-definition, who am I really? Perhaps this is my part of my escape. I can go here and be the true fan of the team and escape my everyday job, which I may find is a good way to make a living, but perhaps doesn't give me some of the internal reward that I want. Now part of that can be there. Displays of passion. I don't think there's anything more fun than seeing people show up at events, dressed in their team colors, their faces painted. Some are very committed to getting those displays of passion involved in it. Cheering if you've never been to games in other countries, that's one of the true enjoyments is watching the consumers there, how they show it in different countries, their passion for their sports. In the United States, we've taken that a step further. We have tailgating, which is a gap, social gatherings in the parking lots, sometimes three, four hours before the game. And those are in turn displays of passion. And that, if we go further down that line, that also becomes part of their family, part of their social interaction. So we see these things and we've encouraged these because we know they meet social demands. One thing I'd like to put out in this particular 
photograph that we've used, these are some Indian nationals living abroad. And during the World Cup, they were avid supporters of the Argentine soccer team. And it was a very interesting little six minute news snippet that talked about almost each one of the categories we've just discussed and how that helped them become part of the community, how to join together, how to share. So this gives the idea of how we can put all of these together and what you and I as sport marketers and sport managers need to think about what can we do to enhance each and every one of these demands that people have, which are separate from the event itself. Remember the hardest thing for all of us to do is to be consistent. So I have to be able to control what I can as a manager and as a marketer. I know the last thing that happens, the coach rarely calls me and asks me what to do on the field, but they will ask my opinion on how do we make the fans happy? How do we get more fans? These are the things that you and I need to work on and consider. Next slide. We have to recognize that even, I think some of the, the benchmarks, if we go back to the Beijing Olympics, and as we see here with the bird's nest, expectations jumped. What spectators wanted to see both on the televised event and at the live event, I think turned up yet another notch. And that we've all begun to incorporate many, many aspects of what we saw just a few years ago. Those expectations rise and they are difficult for us always to meet. But it doesn't have to be perhaps this elaborate as long as it shows that we're putting the effort to put up and deliver the expectations that some will want. Uh, at my own institution, they've now put in new light shows. So instead of fireworks all the time, which pose their own concerns or expenses, they were able to incorporate new lights into the facility, and now the lights have become part of the show, even during the games. So it makes it a very interesting environment. We have to think about, this is what the world's demanding. How do I make that? How do I tailor to those desires? How do I deliver that to enhance my product? and in turn enhance sport consumption. Next slide, please. Again, as we recognize this one, people can have the abilities to pay and want more. As we've left that inexpensive entertainment model, when they spend their money, they have high expectations and we need to be prepared to meet them. So with that in mind, next slide. Why do we need to worry about this? Why is it not just, let's bring them in the game, let's put on a great game for them, win or lose, this is our product. Well, we have a very crowded marketplace. If we consider ourselves in sport and entertainment segment, we have many other things that people can do with their money. So we have to differentiate. If we don't meet their needs, it's easy for them to go somewhere else. We had fears dating back to the first televised games 90 years ago that we worried that television would pull away from live events. I think only in recent years has the television actually played that role. Where now that the ticket price is much more than a very large, very high definition television set, we now have competition and direct competition. And people will make those decisions. So we have to think about that as the crowded marketplace. We need to differentiate ourselves from all the others. Where else can we deliver A, B, and C at one time, at one place? And what can we deliver that you can't get from the televised event? If that's our driver, or if the driver is to get them to watch it on the screen, like we are now, what is it gonna be that drives them there and makes that different experience? <laughs> This allows us also many different avenues to grow and to advance, to increase revenues. And again, with revenues, I don't, we can't just keep passing that on to the consumer in the form of ticket sales or streaming fees. We have to think of other ways to offer opportunities for them to spend money should they choose to do so. So we have to think about that. All of these should allow us to survive the ups and downs of the economies. You know, we have hit some that have lasted longer than others, but sport is not invulnerable to these economic downturns, particularly now that our cost has increased. So we have to be very, very careful of that. If again, if we're delivering what I like to say is more than our money's worth, then people will continue to stay with us and we can survive 
even during the dips in the economy. Next slide. <clears throat> we really need to look at three areas that are all related about how to continue helping sport consumption, things to consider. Again, I know that all these aren't possible in all situations, but they are thoughts for each of us today to consider, could this work? Could we take one small aspect of this and add to our current product? And that's the way I want this conversation to continue. So we look at the event environment, the connectivity, safety, and security. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the things we have to look at, and this is an easy one for those of you and my colleagues out there in the world of facility management, ways that technology that can help us work our way through the facility to make it more functional, to know that how quickly we can adjust and find things. We have to recognize that the more efficient we are at managing the facility, the greater in chance that is to enhance the consumer experience. Part of what I'm doing right now is working with a, a government agency about ways to increase facility management, to improve facility maintenance, just for the idea that will that in turn drive more consumption? I think the answer is gonna be yes. And these are just examples of what can be done through technology. Next slide, please. When we begin to look at the overall environment, again, it goes back to that idea of consumer engagement. And I want all of us to think about the experience begins well before they arrive at our venue. Is it easy to get there? How long will it take? Where do our basic demographics of our consumers, where are they? We need to think about all those things and build that into our plan and do everything possible to make it as easy as we can. I visited one stadium where it was simple. The subway let people out across the street. However, the gate went the opposite direction, which forced people to walk through a neighborhood, uh, you know, not a great distance, but far enough and uncomfortable enough. Whereas if they redesigned it and it opened up to the arena, it was a perfect setting. How that was missed, I don't know, but this is the idea that we owe that to our consumers to think about how they're coming, how long is it taking, what's the expense involved, and try to coordinate and collaborate with other agencies to make sure we've made that great. Things that I, I really do like, I put a picture here of the Blue Man Group. And if any of you have been able to visit and watch their show, it's very entertaining. But I think the one thing, and if, if you haven't, by the way, uh, go to YouTube and watch some videos, particularly of their pre-show. They do a great job. And the minute the people come into the arena, they utilize video boards, telephones, everything they can to engage the audience immediately and that those pieces become part of the act for the entire evening. So gone are the passive, I don't have to sit here and just watch, you become part of the act. Remember you have now influence on what's gonna go on through the night. They do a fantastic job and it's one that we are learning from and that we are emulating in other stadiums and arenas. I think it's something to continue to think about. The idea of the video boards, both interior video boards, multiple locations. Dr. Sutton and I have worked with Oklahoma State where they have a beautiful outdoor stadium for their American football team. And then within that stadium now, they have multiple video boards so that everybody in the stadium can see and enjoy. We can do that in many different ways. From the large ones, the small ones, the video monitors, those help keep people engaged. And again, it's what we've more or less trained them how to consume our product. So that's an important part of that. I think another interesting thing that many teams have done is this idea of using exterior monitor boards, exterior even displays of the game. If you're sold out and you can't take anymore, what's the harm of putting the game telecast on the screen outside if you have the facility that could then host those individuals. That could become another revenue stream, a way to expand seating capacity, expand consumption. That's been successfully done in several places. I know the Miami Heat have been able to do it. Uh, we are considering doing it at several other places as well. But these are things to consider. The other thing to do is the idea of on-floor projections, which have been very nicely done where they turn the entire court in an indoor arena into a projection that they use before, during, after, 
it just gives another way to engage the fans, another way to add another piece of entertainment to it. So these are things to consider as you go into the environment. Next slide. Other things to consider. I like to look at the airline and consider future seating possibilities. And if we take this picture of what it's like on an airplane and we all have our entertainment things in front of us, could this be an option for in-stadium use? And it could be an opt-in that everybody wouldn't want this. Maybe it's a separate seating opportunity. Maybe some would that. So in, now I have the video board in front of me and the seat in front of me. Or I could be watching a, another game of our rival so I can make sure that we stay in first place. It has all kinds of possibilities for us. It could also be another stream of revenue for advertisements, banner boards running at the bottom. I really think these are things that we need to consider. And as we go forward in a couple of the other topics, you'll see how that could start to dovetail together with other ideas. Next slide. Another thing that I really think we have made great steps forward, and I hate to say thanks to the pandemic, but during the pandemic, we became very adept at moving away from cash exchanges, going to cashless facilities and arenas. We've gone to trying to minimize social contact, social distancing, things that we might not always want to mention anymore. But within those, there were some very good ideas. For us in the entertainment world, sport and entertainment world, the idea of concessions and merchandising can continue to use this, where they will speed up the purchase. And many times people will go to concession stands or merchandise stands, and it simply takes too long. I've missed big chunks of the game, big time splits. I don't want to do that. So I don't purchase. That's not a way to do that. Or they become very frustrated and then decide perhaps I'll consume this somewhere else or I'll take another option. It also makes the purchase very easy for everyone. Who doesn't like to tap and go or use your phone and pay and go or pre-order? One of the things that we did bring out of the pandemic was wide ideas of in-seat delivery, almost the idea of Grubhub for the stadium. That could be an effective and efficient way to add value to the product for the consumer. We won't take away the traditional, but we can certainly build this in. And there may be ways to make this happen in an effective and efficient manner. Next, please. One other thing to think about with our stadiums is the idea of flexibility. And the flexibility within our stadium to do many different things. And I've, this, these are three pictures of the stadium in Miami, which is now the Hard Rock Stadium. And if you look at these early shots, they showed several things. The first piece shows the ability for the Miami Dolphins, the professional football team that plays there. And the stadium is all decked out in their colors. Well, they also share the stadium with the University of Miami, the collegiate team. And if you look at the bottom, it's how quickly they were able to convert the stadium, both in capacity and in its overall appearance, for yet another host. They've utilized the ribbon boards. They utilize electronic technology to make these changes. If I had included an additional shot, you would see what the stadium looks like today as they've taken that flexibility concept, reacting to customer needs, and they've added almost an awning all the way around the top. So now they are shaded from the intense floor to sun for the most part, and yet it is still an open air arena. In the top corner, you'll also see the picture of how they were able to convert it for the World Wrestling Entertainment show that was put there. When you can bring in 80,000 people for an event, that's a great way to be able to convert. It was a highly successful event. They did many things to make it work, both from the televised version and the live version. So again, it gives us ideas to learn and the need that we have to be flexible in how we're looking at not only our services, but also in our facilities. Next, please. Sometimes we can look at bigger can be better. You know, this is an example at the at my employer where we put in one of the largest video boards at the time in our athletic conference. This is important for us to do. And if you saw the, have seen any of the pictures of the new stadium in Los Angeles, they have a monstrous 
scoreboard, huge, the largest one there is, nice oval shape. That is how we've trained people to consume, the bulk of people to consume our product. So when they do attend our live events, this is an expectation. I think originally when we started using video playback boards, people said, well, we want them watching the field. I'm going, well, what you want them to do is they're having a good time. And if that means they watch the whole game on that screen, as long as that adds to their enjoyment, their high levels of expectations, that's what we want to do. I think it plays a great part in that and turns out to be a great investment for us all. So multiple considerations to think about that. Next, please. One of the other things to consider, and I'll just briefly mention this, is the idea of universal design looking at stadiums. Uh, with universal designs, it's the environment for the building itself, indoors and outdoors. How aesthetically pleasing is that going to be? Again, I'm very proud of things that have happened at my employer's uh, athletic stadiums because they have made sure that inside and outside, they are pleasing to the consumer. They're enjoyable. You like being in that environment. We want to make sure that, again, everything that we need is listed, is identified. Its information is available to us from the second we leave our home to that stadium. Even now we can go to digital parking guides, et cetera. That needs to be there. The communication environment, if I had to put a star by anything there, again, this is something that we need to truly continue to work on. Then the other idea is how well prepared are we to make it safe and secure, make sure that we have the policies in place, not to police them, but to make sure that everything's done to provide the safest, most enjoyable environment we can. And again, the idea then is this has to be shared from the top down. So from the head of the athletic department to the person helping clean up after the game, we have to all be on the same page and share that attitude of all this enhances the customer experience. What can I do to make it better? Next, please. We have to think with the safety security that the idea behind that would be, we don't want this to happen. This is a, the old stadium in Miami that sadly went for many years without the maintenance it needed and ended up being torn down and replaced. Sometimes they live their lifespans and it's just time. Other times, this could be the problem that we see. We have to work our way through to make sure we have a great, safe environment for all of our customers. Technology gives us many ways to do that. Next, please. Things that we have to think about, and I really want us to focus on, is the idea that the best seat in the house is changing. Maybe it's no longer midfield. Maybe it's no longer the skybox. Next slide. It might well be in our homes. And we have to think about the consumption changes that we have brought on by our success. We all know that we generate millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in the broadcast rights of our events. We have to think about how that's changed the way the consumer expects our product to be delivered whether it's at home or in-house. If you look at this picture, I might say, who's the only one that's actively consuming our product? And it looks to me only that the dog is watching the match. But other than that, each of the other people there are passively consuming. It is on, it is playing. They are engaged in another activity that they want to be involved with. At the same time, passive consumption coming in. So we have to think about this can be part of what we need to incorporate. How do we allow this to happen? Next slide. The connectivity that we mentioned earlier is extremely important for all of us. As fans enter the stadium, we are so well-trained to use our mobile devices for many, many things. We have to make sure that that's possible within our stadiums. Now, at times, demand outpaces our technology. At times, it just outpaces our facility. So we have to make sure that we keep that current, that we make sure that if those that want to be connected, they can be connected, particularly if we say things that ask them to connect. You know, there's nothing more frustrating to have the 
text this number if you have an issue or order, and I can't. We've got to make sure that everything can work to the best of their abilities. I want people to be able to use their devices, both for their personal use and for the benefit of our event. So we have to think, how do we make sure that that's going to take place? Next, please. Cell phones, again, are going to be a great thing for all of us to utilize. We've made great advances. I made sure to include this particular phone because this one's making a comeback. We're going, in many ways, we're going away from the larger phones that often many of us use. And particularly the younger groups, our young consumers, are going to the smaller old flip phones again. So it's something to think about. But this can be used by consumers to report issues, to identify problems that they see. It can be used by the staff any way that we want to. So it's important that we make sure that we can have these things working, working appropriately, and up to the customer's desired level. So we have to make sure that's happening. And again, that's going to be combinations of partnerships between the organization and the supplier. So those are things that we need to make sure are happening for our customers. Next, please. Again, it's to the point we just have to evolve or perish. You know, we cannot afford to dig our heels in the sand or stick our head in the sand and say, no, they're there to watch the game, not be on their phones. Uh, that's no longer the case. Don't fight with the customer. Give the customer what they want. Next, please. Let's take a look at this picture for just a minute. As a great manager or marketer, I want to know what do you see? So take a second and study that. Think about our motives. All right, next slide. What I want you to see is the customer's lifetime value. When we talk about that, remember, we're always wanting to develop the next generation. In this particular family, we have two children tending the game with their father. The dad and the son are perhaps discussing the nuances of the game. Perhaps they're talking about skill acquisition. Perhaps they're questioning a strategy, but they're engaged. What about the young lady? What's she going to say when that game is over? My opinion, she's going to say she had a great time because she's doing what she wanted to be able to do. She might, well, we may have caught her in this one second of looking and playing on her phone. She could be watching another TV show. But when she leaves our event, there's a great possibility that she said, I had a great time last night. That was fun. Even though she may or may not have watched any of the game. But once again, they consumed our product. They're part of gener revenue generation for us. And perhaps if she takes that away, at some point, maybe she appreciates the game more. Maybe not. But this is what we need. If we, and I'll mention again in a minute, the fan cost index for this particular team, for a family of four to attend every single night, and this is a low figure, it's $420.84. That's not cheap. And the particular seats they're in, I guarantee they're more. The idea is that I want to prepare that generation continue to go forward. So we want to think about what do we see? How do we develop this? And we're going to continue looking at it. Next, please. New generation has different expectations than perhaps I do. I don't know that they're dramatically different. But again, if you look at this grouping of fans, are they having fun? Are they engaged? Once again, as long as they leave the game and tell me they had a great time, they really enjoyed their experience, we've succeeded because we don't know whether the team won or not. But if you look at the one young lady, she's laughing and smiling while she's on her phone. They're all having fun. This one went as far to bring his extended earpiece to the game while he's talking to his buddies, maybe at home, about what he's seeing on the court. Things are changing. We have to recognize that. And we have to remember this is the future. So how do we deliver the product in a way that they want it? Next, please. We have to grow with the opportunities. Remember, as we look at that, the more engaged they become, the better the news source becomes, the more they help spread the news for us. And that includes our work with our sport product. So they'll help us get this word out through all types of different social media platforms or just cellular data. Next, please. 
We also have to think about the digital impact, both on the screen and on the field. So what are the possibilities? If I look at the pitch and there's a blank midfield, what could I do with that? Next slide. For the viewers at home, perhaps now I digitally put in this ad for Coca-Cola. Now that gives me great ways. The fans on the field may not see it, but the ones at home do. That also gives me how often could I change that? How many times could I sell the midfield? There are also all kinds of ways that we can possibly do that. We have the technology, obviously. We can do these things. So think about, could we do the same thing with the goalie box? Could we do the same thing with the sidelines for the viewers at home? Are those ways to increase revenues for our product without charging more to the consumer? So what are all possibilities? And there again, they are limitless. Next slide. I don't know that anybody would want to see this, but it is possible, right? So let's don't get locked in to the way we've always done it. What could we explore and do a little bit different? In the United States, Mississippi State University at their collegiate football games did a great thing six years ago where they painted their end zone with the hashtag Hail State. That generated tremendous interest, tremendous response from the customer bases. And even those customers who weren't loyal fans to that school, it intrigued them. Those are things that we want to do. Remember, the thing that we want to do is get the consumer to act. And if that means the hashtag, it used to be a click through, that's what we need to do. Next, please. The WWE launched their network and they have now partnered a year ago with NBC Peacock as a streaming service. And I bring this up just so we can consider other things going forward in the digital space. When they launched this, launched this particular network, 24 hours a day streaming of their particular product, could it work? And we've all sat back and watched. Well, the answer was yes. They had well over a million subscribers and then they sold or partnered with Peacock at a great profit to be able to continue their streaming and added more to the NBC portfolio. So this was an interesting one to watch. And I would encourage all of you to, to look at the ways that they have been able to utilize the space and then to consider the consumption that took place uh, with their merger with NBC. Once again, broaden their audience even more so, made it even easier and less expensive for their customers to have their product. Because now not only do they get the WWE network, they also get the Peacock streaming service for less than they were paying originally for this particular network standing alone. So it was an interesting thing to explore and look at. These are possibilities. Next, please. As we always look to add value to our product, we also wanna add value to the customer. What does that do for the community? And does it sustain the life cycle of our product? You know, we are not invulnerable to our products dying off. And we have to be very, very cautious of how we're looking at this and that we constantly add value. Next, please. I mentioned the fan cost index a moment ago. And this is something I want us all to consider going forward. It helps us keep in line with the ideas of what expenses we're passing on to our customers. And I think sometimes we forget exactly. We think ticket price and we don't think anything else. But we need to think about what's the average price of two adult tickets. If there are children's tickets, what are those average prices? Many people have abandoned those. So if that young man takes a seat, that's a seat. What's the cost of four small soft drinks, two small beers, two hot dogs, et cetera. And then we put those together to see what the costs are for that family to do that. Then we need to compare that with average incomes. Are we forcing people to make economic decisions that, you know, honestly may be taxing to too many? If they are, we need to find other ways to help drive revenues with not always passing that cost on. We need to be cost efficient for our consumers if this is the desire. And remember what this young man represents. To me, he's our future. He must, this one's three years old. Maybe I'll get 80 more years of him consuming our product if I make it affordable, acceptable, meet their expectations. 
So I have many years after he turns an adult that I might hang on to him. So if he lived to 83, we call him an adult at 23, perhaps that's 60 more years of consumption. I have to think that way to be able to drive what I'm doing. Next. One thing I do want you to think about just for a moment is what I call the Lanyap factor. Lanyap is a great South Louisiana French term. It just means a little something extra. We all want to be able to deliver to our customers a little something extra, that one thing free. We used to call this the baker's dozen, where I ordered a dozen beignets or a dozen biscuits, and I received 13. And you all know which one tastes better. It was that 13th one, the free one. That was the great one. We want our customers to feel that way. So we need to find out what that could be. Next, please. Again, all of the line yacht factor focuses on is the idea that people are the key and developing relationships. And the other two pieces of it talk about how to further that relationship on trust, on honesty, on meaningful appreciation of our customers. We have to look at the sport consumer and let them know we appreciate them coming to spend their money with us. And how are we going to do that? Next, please. If we do that, that all that does is ask us to reevaluate, reexamine, and recalculate. If we aren't doing these things regularly anyway, we're probably not following the business principles we should be. Next, please. If we've done that, then we are going to get retention of our fans, we'll get referrals from our friends, and we'll get reciprocity from everyone. So everyone now is doing the same thing to pass it on. Now we become back to the community, the field for the community. Next, please. In conclusion, take a look at the man in the picture. I will tell you uh, the idea of virtual reality, augmented reality, and I look forward to working with our colleagues at GEO in all these areas. Could this ever replace our live sporting event? I know most of us are going, no, never. I think if we're not careful, that's a possibility. And it's worth the least keep in mind, could this happen? We know computer generation of materials is great at this point. It looks realistic. If we don't treat our customers right, maybe this becomes the economic end of it. So we have to think, customer still comes first. The overall enhancement of the consumption has to be a priority. I want all of you to be innovative. I want all of you to be fearless. You know, Don't be afraid to launch out in something new. Explore it. See if it works. If it doesn't work, at least we know one more thing that didn't work, let's try something else. Sometimes we just outpace technology. I still think Google Glasses is gonna be part of our future in many ways, but we were too far ahead of the technology to make it function the way we wanted, but we're not far from that now. Next, please. With that, I wanna thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts and ideas with you today. And I welcome any of you to reach out at any time. And at this point, if there's questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Professor Chalentin, for this fantastic introduction to the topic. And uh, the floor is open now for questions. Uh, you can write it in the chat box. We would help you share the questions. And then we open up the floor for also admissions inquiry. Uh, we have uh, one question that's inquiring about how much theoretical and how much practical would the program be, Professor Jalentin? If you could repeat that one, please. I didn't hear it at all. Yes. The question is uh, how much theoretical and how practical the program would be? I think in all programs here at GEO, the idea is that, and to put it in simple terms, we always believe that you need to get your hands dirty. And that means we need to have practical experience. And what we want to do is develop a program and have developed a program that's gonna be based in theoretical constructs. So you will know the academic information. You will know the principles. We want to help you apply those. So we will have it infused in our curriculum all the way around. We encourage you to go out and become engaged. I want all of us to develop that critical eye 
that as we go out, the most important thing on our walk in the gates may not be the field. It may be everything leading around that part of what we discussed today. So we're going to have a good balance. It doesn't always help us if we can't apply the theoretical and be able to do both. So we mix both in with our program here. And I encourage all working professionals to make sure they're able to utilize research, to utilize data, and then apply that. I see the idea between commercialization of live sport and the core value of sport was a, is a question that popped up in the chat. It's a difficult balance. Again, the, my biggest concern is that we cannot continue to pass on our costs, which continually rise, just to the consumer in the stadium. So we have to take some level of commercialization. That way, I think we can save both the consumer and save the sport, the value of it, just by recognizing we need simple things to do. We need the, the digital boards that advertise. We've already readily accepted jerseys with sponsorships on them. You know, it wasn't too many decades ago, that was unthinkable. But if it helps offset costs that I don't have to pass on, then yes. Now, do I wanna trade all of it? And I do think it's important that you have the correct fit between sponsors and the events. Yes, those are important things we have to do. And those are managerial decisions. Is this the right company for us to partner with? How do we help each other? I think those things are very important to do. So there you can start to get the balance between the two. Always remember our core product is going to be the event, but I have the ancillary products I have to sell. I have to make revenue to be able to keep that core product alive. Thank you, Professor. Uh, mm -hmm. There is also another interesting question is asking uh, what differentiates a Geo Institute versus the other institute? I think this is where we, we should come in with a more of a vision statement and just to give a brief from your perspective. I think with Geo Institute, the number one thing I want to say is that we've built the idea that this is going to be a dynamic program. I know often we have the challenges of how do we do this? How do we add this? And there are so many possibilities out there. And what we want to be able to do is allow the program to adjust and incorporate new trends, new issues, new challenges, and introduce the students to that. And I, I like the idea that as we can adjust, as we go forward with the programs, as we see needs, we know we can add courses into the curriculum. We can add workshops into the curriculum, not wait two or three years down the line, but react immediately to it. And I think we've built the flexibility into the basic structure of the program that will allow for that. And I know all of us that have been involved are excited about that possibility. You'll also get the opportunity, as I mentioned a minute ago, to go out and begin work immediately. We want that combination of work experience, application of theoretical concepts from almost the immediate arrival on campus. So we are gonna have a mix of your internships with varying degrees will be added into the studies that you're doing in the classroom. Thank you, Professor. Um, there are two more perspective-based questions and I would definitely love you to answer these because it's talking about the sports market in India versus in the US. Uh, this question okay. is from Satvik Sharma, and he's asking, uh, how do you see the sports job market in India, uh, where most of the top sports leagues are seasonal and not yearly, possibly in comparison with U.S. is coming into the picture over here, but again, like, to have your perspective would be great. Right. No, I actually think in India, like I'd see globally, I see the prospects for people working in the sport industry is, is nearly unlimited. If you go back to the idea I had of the, the Renaissance era, where things are rapidly changing, there are positions that we're going to need tomorrow that we don't recognize today. And I think from a very entrepreneurial, very innovative workforce coming in, they'll be able to address and meet those needs immediately for the, for the industry. In essence, many sports and all sports are seasonal, but they have to operate year round if they're from a managerial standpoint, they operate year round 
to make sure that we can drive the revenues, have the facilities, maintain the facilities. Those are be year-round opportunities. One other thing I want all students to recognize, in the sport industry, we are probably more global now than ever before. Yeah, things such as this, as I'm actually teaching you from Aruba, uh, working with the government here on some issues. We can do this as if we're sitting in the same room. Your opportunities will be around the world. And the more mobile you become, the more employable you become. And you'll find those opportunities will be there. But I think in India in particular, I think the future is extremely bright. You have a great workforce there. You have the great possibilities for further expansion. I know that we have even North, the NBA has already expanded. I know other parts of the industry in North America are definitely looking to India for continued growth. So I think we have great opportunities. So I, I'm very optimistic about opportunities for all of us employment in India. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, the next question is from Kiran Paul. Uh, they have to ask that we are all in the OTT era right now and its growth is massive for the past few years. Will TV medium survive in future? This is in the context of actually today's consumption and the topic that you just delivered. I think that's a good question. I think what's gonna happen with televised events is they're gonna to continue to evolve. They, we've had so much in the US, the NFL is now available on Amazon, which was unthinkable a decade ago. So now streaming part of the games, that's the only way you can get it if you're part of the Amazon buying group. I think that's going to continue. And I don't know that that's not a positive thing for consumers. I like the idea that I can be sitting in the airport on my flight to Mumbai and I can watch the ball game I, of my choice in the airport. I think that's gonna to continue to drive it. I think that's also gonna change the broadcasting fees and rights. I think those are gonna be areas that we continue to look at. Will broadcasting continue to evolve in the way that we look at it today? Absolutely. When we think about that interactive piece, I think that's one thing. Again, think about the screen that you're watching right now for this webinar, this masterclass. Think about that being your game and that each one of the boxes I'm looking at is a different viewpoint. We know we can already do these things and have done to some degree. Perhaps that becomes the permanent way we do it. I mean, there's lots of options. So I see it evolving. I think televised because we have, again, conditioned everybody that the majority consumes sport this way, that it's up to us to figure out what other ways can we monetize it, generate revenue from it, if we go back to the earlier question, it can't just be covered with ads. There's got to be other ways that we can do it, whether it's easy links to sales. Maybe it's, again, think about the concessions. I want this particular food. Maybe there's a place to order it over on this side. There's ways that we can make all this evolve with it. And I think, to me, I find that exciting about how can we do this? What can we do? And that's where we need bright minds like all of you that are attending today to come find out what those solutions are, to project where we could be. And please don't be afraid to outpace technology. I think we will catch up with it at some point, but that's how all the devices that we have today, they were, I wanted to do this. And they'd say, we don't have the technology, develop it. How do we make this happen? I think that's exciting. And I think that addresses where we think we go with televised events. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, the next question is from Lily Joseph. Uh, she's asking about which skills are needed to pursue a sports management program, precisely this course. I think you need to, particularly with what we're looking today, number one, you need to have great communication skills. I, For my MBA cl a class I taught last night, the number one thing a marketer needs to do is ask great questions and be a terrific listener. And for us in the sport management world, the people we need to listen to are our customers. And we need to then be able to take that information, apply it, put it to work in a way that enhances that experience. So first and foremost, you need to be a great communicator, both in verbal and written and listening skills. Second thing you need to do, you need to be open-minded about how to be a problem solver. We can't adopt the mentality of, well, we've always done it this way. We'll just keep doing it that way. That works well enough. 
I don't know that well enough is the answer that our consumer wants. Remember, if we go back to that, it's more than the game these days. Their expectations, I need to react accordingly. So you need to be a great problem solver as well. We have room in the areas for, again, any interest area you may have. So I know many of you are interested in finance. We definitely need more help on the financial end. I think the majority of what I've mentioned now is really financial implications of what we do. But we also know when we sell teams now, they're selling for billions. So we have to think, how would we fund this? How do we do this? So those are some of the skills that you're gonna need coming in. We are open to all undergraduate degrees and backgrounds. We wanna to talk to you and we'll try our best to bring you up to speed in a hurry in some of the areas. Sometimes that does ask you to do a little bit extra, but it does for all of us. You know, I, I don't wanna admit when I finished school how many decades ago that might've been, but for me, it has also, I've had to make sure I continued to retool to make sure I had the new skill sets as they become available. Because none of us want to be dinosaurs, right? We all know what happened to dinosaurs when they failed to adapt. So we have to think, keep developing skills. We're there to help you develop those skills. We're going to be there to help challenge you. So I think that's the way you need to look at it. Any and all are welcome. We want bright minds. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, like I had mentioned in the beginning of the session today, this program is also open to people who are working in sports at the moment, but they're looking to upskill themselves through a, you know, a professional sports management program. So that is something that we're looking forward to because when experienced people come in, experienced candidates come in, they bring their own I mean, skill set. And this is where the peer learning also happens. So something related to the kind of skills required to do the program, and eventually we're all, all looking at our dream job or the dream career in sports. Now, the kind of roles and offers that could be expected out of this program. If you could sir, provide us an insight from the global perspective, as well how you see it evolving in India in terms of opportunities. Again, the, the global perspective, it, it's, right now it's it's almost hard to imagine for me how unlimited it can be. Now, global expansion of all sports is available and is happening. The NFL is playing, in our case, the National Football League is playing more and more games in Europe again. For a while, we thought that they'd given up ideas of permanent expansion, but that is now back on the table. The NBA is expanding worldwide. So it just gives you an idea. We know the success of football, soccer around the world, how those I'm able to watch the Premier League at any time. I'm able to watch the cricket leagues at any time. I mean, it's that part of it. We know we're having a global impact. People who had not been exposed to our sports, whether they're national sports for us, somewhat regional in terms of the world, now they've become global because they can watch it and begin to develop a great appreciation for those sports that they weren't familiar with before. We also, because of the medium we're using today, are also very comfortable with having people work all around the world for us. So that as long as we can communicate and the workflow is taking place, we've now recognized we don't have to be in the same building. And that we can easily do this. Again, I'm coming to you from Aruba today. So I'm, now I'm in Mumbai. And later today, I'll be back in the United States, all from the comfort of the same desk. So we have to think the global potentials are there. And I think the market is going to continue to grow. The things I mentioned today are not novel to North America. They are universal trends. And I hope some of the, the photos that we showed you lend that framework to it. This is a trend that we're seeing worldwide. So I, I think globally, you've got great, great opportunities, opportunities that never existed before. And I'm excited both for you and for myself. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we have a question from a, you know, probably a prospective candidate. Her name is Mansi and she's from the Simbasa School of Sports Sciences. Her question is regarding the future scope of doing sports management, particularly in India, and again, related to the job security and the availability of job. Uh, she already is from a background of sports science, and that is something that should be of interest to a lot of people who are probably attending at the moment. 
Right, and again, I, I think the opportunities are gonna continue to be there. They're gonna be there in every type of job you can imagine. So as the industry grows, we need more and more. And we have in the stored industry for a while, the trend was to outsource. Recently, it's been more bring it back in house, which means more people with different expertise need to be available. I believe as the industry in India continues to grow because there is an emphasis for it to grow, there will be more and more opportunities, more full-time opportunities. We have to be able to recognize those as a, a person looking in the job market. I have to recognize those. I encourage everyone to look for right now, for today. Go look at what jobs are available in the sport industry worldwide, regardless of location. Begin to look at those skills. Begin to then compare that to your personal skill set. Could I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? The things you have, you continue to polish. The things that you might not have, how do I acquire that skill so that I can hit every one of these? Now, our program at GEO is going to help you be able to mark all those boxes. But even now, you should be able to look at it and go, I need to make sure I've acquired whatever particular skill it may be for my dream job, my aspirant job. And that's the way I think we need to look at it. I really do feel the stability in the sport market is there. I don't, I'm not concerned about it regressing. We're going to continue to grow. We have a popular product. It's just how we deliver, as, as I discussed earlier, will impact how fast it grows. And again, I think in India, we have great opportunities ahead and it will, it will grow. And I think there'll be great opportunities no matter what field, because even though I've talked about the business side from the sports science side related back to training, exercise physiology, those needs will be there too. So there will be opportunities, I think, in all areas. Thank you so much, Professor. We also have our advisor, Dr. Ashish Contractor, in this uh, panel. Uh, so I would uh, invite you to add your points to what Dr. Jilin Yeah, said. thank you. So that was a lovely, lovely presentation and masterclass by Dr. Jilin I just wanted to add one very quick point because a very common question that keeps coming up is what is the scope of, of doing this and what is the scope in our country? Um, as someone, so I am also the director of um, sports medicine at the Sir H and Reliance Foundation Hospital. And I know that the Reliance Group is very actively involved through the foundation for promoting Olympic sport all over the country. Having spent some time both in the US and in India, I think our whole sports industry and especially the as Dr. Andy said, the sort of the, the fan experience, the, the industry around sport is in its very, very infant stages in India. I think it's going to just explode. Everybody has seen how fantastically the cricket league has done. Other leagues are exploding. So I think for, I think someone needs to be on mute. registration yeah, so to continue, so I think that the industry, especially in our country, is absolutely in its very, very early stages, and the scope is fantastic. All of those who are the early adopters who will come out of programs such as ours, um, I think will be in a great position to capitalize as the whole sports industry gets commercialized. So I'm, I'm particularly excited to be part of it. And, and from a student point of view, I think the scope is absolutely uh, tremendous. Thanks, Rajshri. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, I hope in this, uh, in this attendee list today, we have been able to attract some athletes. So this is a, a related question from Dr. Jatin Soni. He's asking, uh, what is your advice to the Indian athletes sharing their experience and, experience, uh, and expertise back to the field after completing sporting life through sports management program? I've always said that athletes had a great advantage because they can see the event, they can see the stadiums, they can see the fans from completely different vantage points than most. And the key there is going to be able to make sure that when you have the opportunity, again, in the middle of an event, I don't expect you to stop and stare at the stands, but during those opportunities that you're able to take those experiences and then bring them back from a management standpoint. The idea is, again, can I see things that could be done differently, better, 
more innovatively, more effectively, more efficiently. And athletes have a different perspective of that. They'll see the, the way that the egress and ingress from the stadiums occurs. They will see how the locker facilities occur. They'll understand the healthcare facilities, whether they're appropriate or not. They have a different perspective. Now, you still need to combine those with the understanding of the business operations as you move into management and the necessary skills there. But that's the world, by the way, that's the world I came from. I came from truly the athletic participant coaching administration side to more as we evolved to more of a business side. So I've always thought that that was an advantage. Uh, it's not, not a guarantee because you do have to realize you have to gain those other skill sets. But again, you do have an advantage because now you have a very holistic view of the industry from all sides. So yeah, just prepare yourself. Make sure you are looking. Make time when there's downtime between practice time, prep time. Make time to visit with the administrators, the managers of the team, the organization, the stadium. Go learn. Again, and become a great person, a great, great question. Listen. Then when the playing days are over, now you're prepared and ready to move on into the managerial world where you could make a tremendous impact. Thank you. And the related question from Diptanj Pardesi, he is asking about how can we collaborate and work in the sports ecosystem? How you can collaborate and say it again, please? How can we collaborate and work in the sports ecosystem? Ah, again, I know I keep going back to the tool that we're using today. Uh, collaboration today is easier than probably ever before. One, make yourself available. Figure out what do you, I always tell my students, what do you bring to the table? And be able to explain, clearly communicate what those skill sets are, what those abilities are. And you'll find people, you know, all you have to do is reach out. If you reached out to me and it was, you have a skill set or you have an interest area that is not one of my main areas, I would feel comfortable saying you should probably contact Dr. Contractor. He might have more insight here. This industry, even though it's a huge global industry, in some ways is still very small. We all tend to know someone somewhere else who can help with an area. So in that sense, I think collaboration has really become very simple. I worked for many years with a colleague in Belfast, Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and then it was just email. If we could have done this more often, uh, we could have been more productive, I think. So I think it's easy to be that way this time. Again, a lot of it's asking. A lot of it's knowing what you can bring. Don't come, as I, again, as I would tell my current students, don't come to the table with just your hands out. You come in and asking, here's what I think I can help add. Here are my skill sets. I would love to collaborate with you. And I think people will appreciate that. And they would love to invite you in. And whatever tasks they give you, do it to the best of your ability and then a little bit more. Remember to add value. And the more confidence I have, the more they'll invite you in. The people in our industry are very happy to help others, particularly in the up and coming, because we all receive help. But what you have to do is make sure you're ready to work hard. Our industry has funny hours. So you have to think, I've got to work hard. I'm going to work long hours but it will pay off because it's a very, in that sense, open-armed industry. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to take up two broadcast-related and viewership-related questions. The first one is, uh, do you think that the pay-per-view culture will take over normal live telecast? And the second one, why are broadcasting deals soaring? Are broadcasters paying too much, so much, so they don't, don't recover the cost? To the first one, do I think pay-per-view is going to take over? I'm in some aspect. I think we've already seen that when uh, specific streaming services or what we used to call cable now, satellite television controls the broadcast. And if you don't have those, you can't watch. I know it's frustrating to me being in another country right now. If I tried to watch the broadcast and I log on to my streaming provider, and they say that's not available in your current country. I'm um, going, well, I'm still paying for it in my country. Why is that not? It's still my same computer. Those are things I think will conquer, and they'll have more global implications as we go. Completely replace 
do a pay for it game by game, that may be an appropriate option, to be honest with you. I may not want a season ticket to watch every South Carolina game. Maybe I just want to watch two. Maybe I can buy two for much less price than an entire season. Or I get a bigger bargain, just like a season ticket, if I buy the entire season. I think we just need to offer those to people. I think that's where it's gone uh, and where it is going. There will always, I think, be some degree of free broadcast because I know the, the leagues in particular know that's good for business. And it's hard to think that we condition the world to consume it through television and through radio and then suddenly just take it all away. I think, again, just options. And we all know that if we're on streaming or if we have a cable, that sometimes the broadcast stream is better. Again, then it's a consumer option. If I can't afford it and I can get the free broadcast with more commercials, that's what I get. If I can afford the better version with less commercials, then I pay for that. Again, it's about, I think, giving consumers options of ways to do it and then let them choose. So I think if that kind of a roundabout way to answer your question is that I do think it's part of our future because it, it's already happening, but I don't think it'll completely replace it. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one very interesting question. This is uh, about can someone move to sports doing a general MBA instead of a specialist sports management course? I mean, as far as I know, a lot of people have come into sports from a general management background, but I think uh, from your perspective and from your experience, it's important to know why we need a specific sports management course and what it means overall. Oh, absolutely. There is, there's value in having a general MBA. So there is value there. I've always felt that there is additional value in having one that is directly applied to a specific industry. It's because that key word in there. Now we're showing you direct application to what you have chosen and projected as your future employment area industry that you want to work in. Now, as an employer, that gives me a feel that at least you have a little more specific training for our particular business, our niche in the business, because all things are not exactly the same. Remember in our product, and we're, again, we're a luxury item. We're not something that people have to have. So perhaps there's different ways that we need to look at what we do. So those are things that we want to think about as we look at, do I want to get a specific degree or a general degree? And again, I have the highest regards for anybody getting an MBA, but I do like the idea that you can go through the program, have it applied to a specific industry. And then when I hire you to come in the industry, you are that much more prepared to hit the ground running, jump into the workforce, be successful, be productive. And then my thought also is that allows you quicker steps for progress within that industry. Whereas others still could have the basic skill sets, but would then have to learn on the job a little bit more than I think those of you with a specific degree. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we are also in the phase of the post-COVID era. So one of the questions is regarding how has COVID impacted and how do we see that change in stadium attendance at the moment? What do you feel so? I think we, we learned a lot of very valuable lessons during the pandemic. And I am one who wants us to remember those lessons and again, not stick our heads in the sand and pretend it never happened which many people seem to want to do. And I understand a little bit why we'd like to forget when we were all locked down, but things that we did learn. Number one, we did learn the ideas of maybe we don't need to put, in our case, 82,000 people in the stadium to be successful. Maybe that isn't the answer. Maybe we could survive on a fraction of that live attendance and then offer other streaming opportunities. Perhaps we were making seats too tight and that we did like having a little extra space more. Again, thinking that we're adding to the environment. Those are things that we learned coming out of the pandemic. How do we allow customers other ways to spend money? I think all of us have attended an event live where you look up and there'll be a block of empty seats. And those typically would recognize, reflect seats that were not sold. Well, do we leave those as 
empty seats? Or do we offer people the opportunity from abroad or from elsewhere that couldn't attend the event? If you'd like to contribute, you can now buy that cardboard cutout just like we did in the pandemic and put it in the seat. I think people, some people still would like to do that. I can't be there this season. I want that seat. I'll pay the lesser fee. And then for us, it gives a different feel. And sometimes people were very creative with those ideas during the pandemic. Those things I like the idea of. Love. The idea of having things a bit more sanitary. I like the idea of everybody. My example would be everybody didn't need to touch the food dispensers or the napkin dispensers. Perhaps those are more efficient ways that when we hand you your food or your concession, that it's already packaged up that way, ready to go. Those are things I think we can learn. We became very effective, very efficient. I mentioned earlier the idea of cashless. I think that's here. We did it a little bit before. Now we're all used to it. So I think cashless is the way to go. It doesn't mean that people can't use cash, but we've made it to where in the US, if I'm a cashless facility and all you have is money, you go quickly to our guest services and for your $20 bill, they'll give you a $20 scan and go card. It's that the money will remain good even after you leave the event. Those are ways that we've learned to adjust. I think we're gonna continue to do that. So simple things I think that we need to continue to learn from, and I think we will. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'll take one more question from the program point of view, uh, followed by a couple of questions from the admissions point of view. Uh, so the question is, um, what skills must be developed to become a good sports agent? Oh, what about becoming a sports agent? You need to understand the law inside now. You need to be great at contract negotiations. You need to always do what's best for your client. Those skills are, they're skills that need constant polishing because that's gonna be your job. Now, on the other end of being a sports agent, you also have to be prepared to offer multiple services to the client, everywhere from financial advice to lifestyle advice, to branding advice, and you'll need to bring in people that have that expertise if you do not have it. So it's a great way to do it. It is, a, I'll, I'll tell you, it is, a, it is a busy, busy, I'll call it a 24 seven job. Because that, you work for that individual or individuals uh, to make your income, you owe them a service and you have to be prepared to deliver that service at all times. So while it can be a very good profession, it is a busy profession. It requires great understanding of the legal aspects of not only your country, but of other countries. So you have to do is not just the negotiation, it's understanding the legalities as you go into other countries. Again, particularly in this global environment where your best football player is gonna move and play in the MLS, what impact does that have? How do we negotiate the deals? Those are things you're going to have to learn. So I think in the U.S., I tell people to do two things. One, if you really want to be an agent, I tell them, well, you need to consider law school uh, before or after your sport management degree. I think then the combination of things, you become extremely valuable and the opportunities will increase in my belief. Uh, you could do one or the other without, but I think you need great training in both. Thank you very much, Professor. That was extremely insightful and we look forward to hosting you next month as well as the start of the program, getting more into details about all the topics that you've shared today. Uh, we close the questions and answers on program at the moment, but we are happy to take questions over email. I will type in two email IDs on the chat box. Uh, all of the attendees can note that. And now we open up the floor for any specific questions related to admissions. Our team would also be typing into your chat box in terms of reply. So thank you very much. This was really uh, helpful for us to understand the interest for this program to have Professor Andy deliver the first masterclass. And we look forward to meeting you probably in campus pretty much soon. Uh, this Saturday, there's an admissions meeting and the campus is open for walk-in and see the facilities here and get a 
uh, idea of what we have an offer for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was great to be able to interact with all of you. I look forward to seeing many of you in India.